So aircraft may have tails like this, or this, or like this. And this one too. So did you notice anything? No? Well, if it is still a no, you need to keep watching. In the history of aviation, one of the constants has always been the research of lower and lower drag. In fact, lower drag has plenty of benefits for civilian and military aircraft alike. Less thrust for the same performance. Lower drag means lower specific fuel consumption, so longer ranges or more payload for the same range. Now, drag depends from the air density, the speed squared, the body surface, and the coefficient. And this is the coefficient that measures how aerodynamic is a body. The lower the coefficient, the lower is the drag. Obviously, everything else equal. And by the way, this is how the drag coefficient has kept reducing in the history of aviation. There are indeed several effects that cause the aircraft drag, and their relative importance varies with speed. There are various ways of breaking down drag in its components, and the component we are interested in today is pressure drag. Pressure drag is calculated as the integration of the local pressure on the whole of the aircraft for a specific flight condition and attitude. In practice, it means that if you sum all the pressure acting on the aircraft, what you obtain is, uh, well, a drag. Uh, yes, it's never trust for any practical purposes. There are no free lunches. So let us consider the airflow of a sphere moving through the air. While the air approaches the sphere, the pressure increases. Here there will be, here on the top of the sphere, there will be a point that is called a stagnation point, where the pressure will be max. So if this is the pressure of the asymptotic flow ahead of the bolt, this will be the maximum pressure around the ball. Uh, then the flow will separate, sort of symmetrically, if the ball is not rotating, around the ball in this way. While it's going around the ball, the speed is increasing and the pressure is decreasing because, because in general, speed and pressure behave in opposite ways. The faster the speed flow, the slower is the pressure. Here on top, you will reach the minimum pressure and the maximum speed. Then, after reaching this extreme point, the flow will start uh, going on the back of the sphere like this. But here, in this way, pressure is going to increase again. When an airflow is moving against a rising pressure, when the flow is moving against a pressure gradient, it may happen the so-called flow separation. That is, the flow is no longer attached to the sphere, but goes away like this. So this phenomenon may not always happen, but for our purpose, when we are talking an aircraft and at those speed, it's going to happen. Now, when the separation happens uh, in this area here, in the wake formed from the separated flow, there is an area of turbulent flow. Now, turbulent air, since it's spinning very fast, it's moving very fast, exerts a relatively low pressure. When you have separation and consider the entirety of the body, you have high pressure here, low pressure here, and this means that you will have a resulting drag. God of aerodynamics, please forgive me. Now, separation increases when the pressure increases too quickly, when the gradient is very strong. So the best way to reduce the probability of the separation is streamline a body like this. 
in this way the flow will go around as before but the increase in pressure uh, along the tail will be much slower and it is possible that the flows stay attached till the end of the body obviously at higher speed or maybe at different angles of the flow for example if the flow is coming from here it is still possible to have separation even on a streamlined body but its occurrence is generally delayed please keep this in mind so this is how the drag coefficient varies if we streamline the sphere and you can easily imagine that this is the reason why civilian and transport aircraft do have this type of streamlined tail. Yes, but what about fighters? Fighters don't have the same configuration as a transport plane. Well, it's quite intuitive. If the airplane rolls violently in this direction, a wing made like this will likely bend in this way and the other one will bend in this way. Definitely not a sound structural design for maneuvers. Well, there are some examples that do not conform to this rule, but after World War II, they are really few and far between. A detailed discussion would take us too far, but the point is, fighters have the engines in the fuselage and the nozzle in the tail. And now you know that the tail is important for reducing drag and the interaction between the nozzle, the exhaust plume and the aft body of the aircraft is not easy to predict. But it is very important because make an error there and you will have excessive drag. Some projects like the F-15 or the Tornado actually had to redesign large sections of the aft body exactly for this problem. More on this later. So within the nozzle, the gas expands from high to low pressure. So here we have a P high and here we have a pressure low. While expanding, they will accelerate and accelerating, they will produce thrust. For our purpose, depending from the conditions of the flow out of the nozzle, we can have two conditions. The plume is over expanded. The pressure here is lower than the atmospheric pressure just outside the nozzle. So the wake, the plume, is actually squished and its section is narrower than the section of the nozzle. If the plume is under expanded and this pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure, then the diameter of the plume will increase and it will be larger than the diameter of the nozzle. Uh, these in general are not desirable conditions. What you want is to have a plume that doesn't expand or contract because all the energy available has been used to expand in the nozzle, which is the most efficient expansion that produces the most thrust. And this is the reason why variable nozzles do exist. But still, you have a limited range of variations possible from the nozzle. There are mechanical limits. So these two conditions of under expansion or over expansion still happen. In practice, you have over expansion at subsonic speed and under expansion at supersonic speed. So the exit plume may have different shapes and this shape actually interacts with the flow around the aft body of the aircraft in a way that is difficult to predict. In general, the plume behaves like a solid body in the first part, close to the nozzle, that is actually displacing 
the airflow, but after a while it starts behaving like a jet pump basically and it starts sucking the aerodynamic flow in. At subsonic speed this may change the aerodynamic field in this area of the aircraft, while at supersonic speed, since by definition the speed of sound is the speed at which the perturbations move through the fluid, there will probably be one or two shock waves in this position, and there will be minimal effects uh, upstream, but not zero because there is always a thin layer very close to the body of the aircraft where the speed is subsonic, even though the whole aircraft is supersonic. For example, when the nozzle is underexpanded and the plume actually increases in diameter, it actually compresses the flow in these regions and it produces some additional thrust on the structure of the aircraft. This is called post-exit thrust. Aircraft like this or this actually make good use of this situation, but this is not a desirable condition. In fact, the expansion in the nozzle is way more efficient than the expansion outside the nozzle, and this solution requires a heat-resistant cladding on the tail boom, thus adding weight to the whole aircraft. So by now it should be clear how the aft body design is extremely important. The tapered section of an aerodynamic body is often called boat tail in literature. Millennium and I do not like this term so we keep calling it aft body or rear section of the aircraft. Thanks Otis. So if it is necessary to taper the body of the aircraft to minimize drag, in a fighter this implies a very accurate cowlings that fillet the fuselage with the nozzle and the engine structure. However, this design is not trivial because the risk is the one that we have seen at the beginning. Flow separation. The tapering angle must not be too acute because otherwise it risks creating separation, flow separation and then additional drag, but it must not be too shallow either because otherwise you risk designing an aircraft which is going to be too big, too long, and mind an extra weight here will produce uh, extra drag and it will add weight to the aircraft. So as a rule of thumb you should have a taper angle between 10 and 25 degrees. This will reduce your whole aircraft drag coefficient and it will also delay flow separation problems. For example, the tornado had serious flow separation issues in the trench between the two engines. And this was so important for the aircraft performance that required a rather important redesign of the tail. In fact, in the tornadoes that you see today, you don't see a particularly deep gap between the two engines. It required a massive filler to fix the problem. And this brought the overall taper of the rear part of the fuselage at about 13 degrees. During the F-15 development, the original taper of the aft section was 24 degrees, but after the wind tunnel testing campaigns, it had to be reduced to 20 exactly for the same problem. On the just 39 Gripen, the tail cone was one of the critical elements of the project. Yes, because since the Gripen is a light single engine fighter with relatively limited thrust to weight ratios, the designers heavily relied on an extremely well optimized tail cone to reduce the drag and still guarantee some decent performances. 
Should the tail cone for any reason fail to deliver, probably the entire project would have been in serious, serious, serious troubles. Actually, the Gripen, from an aerodynamic point of view, is an extremely interesting aircraft. And if you want to learn more about its design, including the tail cone, go and watch the video that is going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching and see you there.